Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, a show with aspirations looking to cast a wide net on local issues, provincial, national, international. I'm Robin Adair, and um, our international representative of note, uh, standing in for the nation of Croatia, or at least he's a watered down product of the nation of Croatia. My co-host with the most, the Croatian sensation himself, John Jurisic. And John, as usual, there's so much going on. Overwhelming amounts of stuff to talk about. No kidding, Robin. You know, we had former MLA Sheila Orr on for a short segment this past week. And boy, oh boy, did she take off the gloves regarding Justin Trudeau. She doesn't doubt the accusations of the Chinese government interference in our elections, as many of us share those opinions. And she doesn't doubt that Justin faces a loss when he next goes to the polls. Yet again, I think shared by many of us. So many reactions to Sheila's comments. A flood of comments, especially on YouTube. Karen writes, for example, the voters want him gone and a public inquiry now. And Ernie had this to say, Ms. Orr is absolutely correct when she says Trudeau doesn't care what the public thinks. He adds... He, as in Trudeau, he's a preening narcissist who has always been and always will be grossly underqualified in his office. And Virginia says this about Sheila Orr's comments, tragically true. (laughs) So let's hear a little bit more from Sheila Orr and what generated so much excitement on the internet, especially YouTube, starting with her belief that it's not just Justin Trudeau who doesn't want to go because he has a whole team behind him that don't want to lose power. We all forget that it's not the the one man and his family. It's all these other people around him. We all know this, that all have their salaries from that department. You know, it's a big machine. Everyone's employed um, and they're all happy being there. So nobody actually sits down and tells the truth. They say, Oh, no, it's going to be fine. Don't worry. Don't worry, Mr. Mr. Prime Minister. You're very popular. <laughs> Half of the country are saying, well, actually, you're not. And we would like an election. Yeah. But the others are saying, no, no, you're fine. So this whole Chinese um, um, situation, you would think it would actually bring him down. But because they do have a very interesting and good crisis management team, they, uh, they actually, um, I think, will ride it through. They usually do. Sheila, that leads perfectly into my question. Uh, first of all, great to have you back. Love speaking to you, as do our viewers. So <laughs> that is a, a double whammy for the Rumble Room. Um, Except for the ones that actually phone in and complain, but that's good. <laughs> but they watch they watch you twice as much, Sheila. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. I'm a big Guess believer who in good debate. I love good debate, and bless them. Keep it, keep it coming. Well, okay, now I'm going to really prompt you, because guess who we're going to talk about? Pierre Polia. Yeah. <laughs> and I uh, can't imagine how you're going to react, given your long history as a federal liberal. But just the same, he has had some huge crowds huge. on Vancouver Island. I mean, I am not kidding. But just the same, uh, you know, he was recently in an air hangar in Sydney. We got pictures of that. And it was like, what is going on here? It certainly reminded Robin and I of of some past meetings mm-hmm. with somebody named Preston Manning. Do you mm-hmm. sense that this Pierre Polyev stuff is reminiscent of that time and the Reform Party uh, sort of growing? It's certainly a growth. There's no question about that. Uh, as you know, I'm a federal liberal, dislike my prime minister intensely, but I still am a federal liberal. I'm not ju- ju- jumping ship. <laughs> uh, my husband is a conservative. We live with that in this house and uh, we get by it, especially election time. But there you are. He is a hardcore conservative and he's been going to these meetings and there and he comes back and tells me, obviously, I don't go. What is happening, which is uh, and he comes back and he reports all the federal liberals that are at those meetings. So a lot of federal liberals have actually gone to these meetings and I'm hearing my, you know, my my peer group or the people that uh, have been involved with ha, ha, have jumped ship 
I mean, um, federal liberals are pretty good at sticking to what they believe in that. You know, you're a federal liberal, you're a federal liberal. But uh, yeah, no, um, there's, the crowds are huge. He's gaining momentum. What are you hearing is going on in Toronto and Quebec with this guy? Well, I'm not hearing. I mean, I think he's still getting crowds there. Will he be able to pull in Quebec? Uh, let's be honest. The elections are won over there. Mm -hmm. However, when you see somebody gaining momentum in the West like he has, believe me, the East is looking. How can he get these crowds? You know, it's 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 like anything. You know, when you see a, it's like a, a rolling snowball it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Sheila, she's always so colorful, and uh, we'll be bringing her back again in, in a few weeks' time to talk about the coronation and Harry and Meghan always favorite topics. But let's shift over now to issues directly surrounding Vancouver Island. Uh, many ramifications around the country on this story. And uh, we're talking right now about Island Rail and the focus mm -hmm. on uh, swinging over to First Nations and reconciliation and that that needs to be dealt with before any final decision can be made on the future of the rail. Long-term viewer of our program, Richard, who hails from Comox, very eloquent in his response to this. And uh, this is what he has to say about the rail corridor. He writes, with all the closures of sawmills, pulp mills and other industry, I cannot fathom that it would be worth the investments to resurrect a rail line, which in its heyday couldn't make a go of it. And Richard goes on to say, I think the government should develop walking and biking trails along the old rail line and encourage walking and riding tourism instead. And it's certainly not the first time we've heard this argument, John. Absolutely, Robin. Uh, you know, this issue isn't dead, but I think the trend lines don't look good for rail. I think it looks good for commercial rail. But, you know, summarizing a progress to date, I don't think we're getting anywhere with that. However, I am a bike rider, an e-bike rider, and I would love to see more bike trails. But, you know, someone has to pay for that. But let's shift again, Robin, OK, because there's so much news. And there, frankly, is so much crime on our city streets. Come on. Come on, governments. Get with the program and try to fix this. Vancouver's problems with drugs and crime has spread across the province and certainly now taken hold in Victoria. Come on. It's, it's a terrible dilemma, and the businesses are really struggling with this. They already have staffing shortages, supply chain issues, and of course, now they're doing all this interesting stuff to make sure we pay more for parking <laughs> earlier and later in the day. And there's even fewer workers for services. There's so many headaches going on post-COVID. And uh, so we wanted to hear a good, clear voice from business, not an official voice necessarily, but a typical business reaction to what's going on and what is going wrong and boy did we find the right person representing uh, business issues on the streets of victoria david schneider is from schneider wealth management of aligned capital partners he's deeply concerned about victoria's direction he talks every day with numerous business owners and he joins us now Let's zoom him in. Well, now joining us for the first time in the Rumble Room is a Schneider Wealth Management Advisor, David Schneider, here to talk about the state of Victoria from a business person's perspective, a perspective sadly lacking in media. Welcome to the show, Dave. Yeah, thanks for having me, gentlemen. Congrats Absolutely. On, congrats on your show. It's uh, I'm glad the popularity is building. Well done. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, it sure is. We keep hearing that our supportive housing is dangerous. While at the same time, there are plenty of tents on city boulevards and plenty of problems. David, what do you think when you hear that City Hall, and certainly what does your network hear about when City Hall wants to cut the police budget? Yeah, it's, uh, it's disturbing. Uh, we saw a lot of this in the United States, the push two, three years ago when there was a movement, um, probably the biggest thing of the business leaders I talked to before this telecast is that we need public safety, um, perception and actual, or we're not going anywhere. Um, so when there is funding that's needed, I think for, first and foremost is, is on the policing side, 
we're extremely fortunate probably having one of the best police chiefs we could have in all of Canada. It's disturbing when I hear things are being cut back because the crime is what's causing the cascade of effects throughout um, the community, the safety of the community. And as we're finding out, businesses are leaving downtown and then that cascades into more problems because people don't feel safe downtown. You start to wonder what our downtown is going to be all about. You hear that uh, there's a lot of people since the, co uh, the COVID pandemic that want to stay and work at home. So a lot of government offices suddenly won't have as many civil servants walking around. The rest of downtown really relies, for the most part, on tourism and hospitality. But I don't know how hospitable it is for these uh, businesses. And uh, you keep hearing about longstanding businesses that are thinking about pulling up and leaving. I mean, you 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 go downtown quite a bit. Uh, how much do you think Victoria has changed over the last few years? I think I think it's changed dramatically. And, and I really feel um, to share something I've been sharing for many months now with my investment network and with my community leaders and friends here in Victoria in the last three years since COVID started, we've had the perfect storm. And a community like Victoria, I think has been hurt on a percentage basis more than anything else. And let me explain. First of all, um, it hurt the hospitality and the tourism sec sector second to none for almost two years, wiped it out. Um, it does come back a bit, but hospitality doesn't fully come back. Um, we have found out that the lockdown measures in many cases were too much and it's hurt us tremendously. And with it, um, yes, tourism has come back, but never is gonna be as much as before. But the problem with the f food and beverage industry, the hospitality, it really has a hard time coming back. So we were hurt there uh, with these government measures, mostly on the provincial and some on the federal side. And then we had another major effect of, of COVID, and that was the fact that the rich got richer. Uh, zero interest rate policy, which we're now finding with this credit crisis was the worst thing they could have done, keeping rates too low for too long. Uh, hence, uh, it was a combination of um, housing prices going up dramatically. At the same time, executives right across North America are allowed to work anywhere they want. Well, in many cases, the footprint of Victoria and this community and, and this peninsula is very small on a global basis. So then we had a cascade of people coming into the community. And that's why there was just a report this morning showing that down payments have gone up 25 to 30 percent in most regions in B.C. So now you have the young people that are supposed to support this tourism and hospitality side. They can't afford to be here. They can't afford to live here. It's really a poverty issue. In Canada, they love calling it homeless, but it's really a poverty issue. And with poverty, we have the sad cases of uh, mental illness, of drug addiction. Um, more than ever, we have to work together and more than ever, we have to be more empathetic, uh, um, more empathetic to all these people because they truly need help. But this combination of all these factors, on top of the fact that our healthcare system has truly collapsed, gentlemen. I know they don't want to talk about it, but it's collapsed. Uh, you talk to doctors privately, you talk to healthcare workers, it's privately. And guess what happens? We have now have a healthcare system that's supposed to support our our community. It's not. So it's a really it's a really tough situation. The good thing about Victoria, it's small enough, and we have industry and community leaders that get together. But boy, never in the history of this city have we got to have to get together more than now. David, uh, there are lots of labels being used in this debate. Okay. Yeah. On the one hand, the, the business community is often labeled as fat cats, uh, people who don't care about the disadvantage. While on the other side of the fence, we hear a lot about the woke movement and from poverty advocates who say that they speak for the average person. Are any of these labels fair? Well, yeah, there's all kinds of labels out there. And and, and unfortunately, we're, we're so divided on so many subjects right now. And we can't come to come up with solutions because of it. But, you know, when you're a business person, you're looking at the entire picture. You're looking at making decisions of the opportunities and also the pitfalls with it. You know, when I talked about the healthcare decisions, the collateral damage of focusing on one thing with COVID now has affected everything else with healthcare. Now the city downtown is looking at things 
such as, let's just take an example, A to A parking. Um, there's so many businesses there. The busiest is between six and nine in the evening and before nine o'clock in the morning because people can't afford to park. You know, I know, I know a hairstylist that they're busiest before nine o'clock in the morning. And I see the comments. It's because of climate. Um, it's, it's really unfortunate. And you, you wonder what the collateral damage is going to be with decisions like this. And it's going to cascade. You know, I, I get a kick out of the comment of uh, let's get you for a bus downtown to do your shopping. Like, you know, let's let's get you on public transit. We, we don't want you to take a car. Well, how much can you shop and carry in a bus versus having a car downtown where you can pack up your back seat in your trunk? It doesn't make any sense. People still want to drive. People still want to use their car. It's not going to change. So it's really unfortunate that we have, I don't like using the term virtue signaling um, throughout governments, you know, provincially, federally, and on the municipal side, which really has some harmful, harmful effects. And, you know, when, when I got to give, give you an idea, like when 10% of the world's emissions come from the 10 biggest coal plants in the world, and we think we can do something about it, sorry. On the other hand, the uh, people that are working at City Hall now are saying they want to change the way we think about our downtown and the way we live as people and, um, you know, walk more, ride bicycles more, don't take your car, you know, be more responsible. Uh, there's a there's a movement, there's a movement in our society to change the way society thinks and that there's a, a I think, a feeling out there that if we move towards this new model, we will live a more... <laughs> fulsome, righteous, environmentally friendly life and who people that are against this tend to be people who are privileged and frankly don't don't care about the future of our planet. And it makes people seem almost evil who are in opposition. It's a, kind of two, uh, two mindsets that just cannot seem to line up and understand each other. Do you think that we're at the yin and we're going to move to the yang and eventually there'll be a flip uh, to the other side of the political equation? I think um, we're going to get into such a devastating situation from a crime perspective, from a downtown being ripped out, that people realize this just does, does, doesn't work. When there's no safety downtown, they don't want to go on bikes downtown. I get a kick, and my, my biker friends that are great bikers, none of them were consulted. There was probably no consulting groups when they put in the bike lanes with all the bikers that actually use the bikes. They're just absolutely blown away. Um, no, it's, you know, I know it's really nice and we're, we're doing things, but I'll be honest with you, gentlemen, there are some really, really good mayors that connect with my resource development people in BC that are doing all the collaborative work with the resource sector government, First Nations communities. They know that we need resource projects to keep this economy alive and to pay for everything. And they're doing it quietly behind the scenes, but they get it because they're seeing their operating statements at the municipal level. And, and the numbers don't work unless we have economic activity. Housing will kind of hold up, but now we're seeing the problems of taxing too much on housing. Um, it's causing the problems with, you know, too expensive to do a 1,000 square foot of condos because so much of it's taxes now. Um, you know, there are, there are community leaders, there are municipal leaders that get it. Um, I really just hope they get it here locally because, uh, you know, as I said, the perfect storm, it is just absolutely cascading because then then all of a sudden we don't have money for really important projects. Um, we, you know, I I, uh, I wrote down what they probably the biggest capital investment strategies we need is we need the funds for a new crystal pool. Um, you know, ship point needs to be resurrected and properly developed and and we, like other major communities that are also destination spot for tourism, we need a library that is our hub for our community, like there it is throughout Europe and other cities in Canada. But they're going to be told there's not going to be any money. Well, money needs business. And when you see these businesses, many of them now going up to Saanich, up to, up to uh, Uptown, yeah, the rents are quite a bit expensive up there, but it's safer and that's where their customers want to go. Uh, they're leaving downtown, going to Oak Bay. Um, they're going out to Sydney. You see more and more of it. And it's actually, you know, I know if you, you guys for a while, it's actually so sad to see some long-term businesses saying, I can't, I can't do it anymore. David had plenty more to say. Uh, 
I think we could have been listening to him for hours because those issues are par are so prolific all through downtown. You know, as the issues around civil servants and, and working from home. He believes this is hurting our downtown commerce and that people working from home are less productive. Well, that's a whole show, isn't it? And so we'll get him back into the Rumble Room sometime in the future to dig deeper on what all that means. Certainly, David represents a, a quorum of view in this city, in this community, and uh, we have received mail that kind of reflects some of his views. For example, this note from Jerry. I'm against parking meters downtown entirely. One of the many reasons I do not go downtown. <laughs> and uh, I just want to mention that uh, I go downtown. I enjoy shopping there. I still enjoy downtown Victoria, but I don't go very much at night and I sure pick my spots. And boy, in the old days, I remember when I first moved here when I was a young man, they used to say that Victoria rolled up the sidewalks at about eight o'clock at night. It's sure not the case today, John. Uh, so let's now tell our viewers about uh, some other issues that are going on. John, uh, the, uh, the Rumble Room is really taking off on various formats and we've really taken on new life on YouTube. Yeah, boy, have we ever. Um, <sighs> Big, big uh, uptick in YouTube viewership recently. You know, if you, you you now see our YouTube link, you see our Facebook link, all the other platforms we are on. But let me spend a second or two on YouTube. And please, you know, if you're watching our videos that way, which clearly thousands of you are, we encourage you to press the like button and subscribe. That helps our reach. It helps the commentary. It helps our Vancouver Island perspective from the Rumble Room reach the world. And it appears that that is happening. So I encourage you to join all of our platforms. But today, click on that YouTube uh, like button and subscribe. What a show. What commentary. What reaction. Oh, my gosh. So looking forward to next week when we talk about museums and tourism with local MLA, it is local, I'm going to say that, to our folks who are watching from afar, BC Minister Lana Popham. That should be really fun for now and forever. I remain John Jurisic. And uh, I just want to thank all of our viewers. This is our two-year anniversary time, and uh, we've reached almost 900,000 views. So thank you very much for that. I'm Robin Adair, and rumble on! <laughs>